I'm going to talk most of the time in this talk at a different level, at the, talking about species trees and extinction and speciation rates. But I want to circle back to some of the issues that have come up so far in this workshop and look at population level inferences at the end of this talk. But for most of it, I'm going to be working at the species level. And the talk that I'm going to give is, comes out of a comparative literature but kind of marries two different sorts of comparative questions we might want to ask when we're looking at the tree of life. And the first type of comparative question looks at how does a trait influence species and, uh, speciation and extinction rate. And the classic way to do this was by using sister species analyses that compared groups that say were herbivorous insects versus non-herbivorous insects, and they would look in the tree of life and say, which is more diverse, which has more species? And if you repeated that sister clade analysis again and again and again, you'd have enough power to make inferences like Mitter et al. did, that herbivory increases diversification rates. And there's a whole series of, of papers taking this approach. Another type of comparative analysis question, though, asks a different type of question. It takes a look at the tree of life and says, where have the transitions occurred? And in what direction do they tend to occur? For example, you might ask with vivipary, mangroves are interesting because they are viviparous. The seed grows immediately into the plant, but also it's very salt tolerant. And so if we reconstruct the um, evolution of this trait, has it evolved multiple times or has it only evolved once and is a shared characteristic of that single evolutionary transition? So that's a single, sim another type of question that you might ask about the tree of life. But what if you are actually interested in, evol in an evolving trait that influences this, the shape of the tree, that influences the speciation and extinction rate? You can't actually separate out ancestral reconstruction from effects on speciation and extinction rate because that same trait is influencing the shape. It's influencing the phylogeny or the graph that we see, thinking of the phylogeny as a graph. The shape of it depends on that trait. So one implication is that diverse, if the trait influences the rate of speciation and extinction rate, then those rates, the speciation and extinction rate leading to lineages that you don't see, varies across this tree. Sister clade analysis deal with that variation by trying to ignore it largely, focusing in on those sister clades where you see a difference between um, with one trait on one side and the other trait of the other side of that node and ignoring the rest of the tree um, and losing some power in doing so. One of the other issues if you do a sister clade analysis and drop the rest of the tree though is that of course you can't tell, it's a sign test, so you can't tell what makes a particular trait like herbivory and insects a more diverse clade, whether it's a higher speciation rate or they're less prone to going extinct. So you lose that piece of information too, as well as losing power by just asking which is more diverse than the other. The other um, problem that arises, and I think this is underappreciated, is that trait inference is misled if that trait influences speciation and extinction rates. And here's just a cartoon issue, uh, example of that problem so that you can see why it is a problem. So let's, let's say that you know um, from the rest of the tree or from previous data that um, the purple and the green are equally likely to go extinct. Well, then you might infer uh, likelihood and parsimony methods would both infer that the ancestral state here is likely purple. There's just not that much time separating those two. But what if instead I told you the rest of the tree or other data says purple is a really extinction prone state? Well, then that'll shift the likelihood that this ancestor was purple towards green because it had to persist long enough to lead to two descendant lineages. So that makes it more likely that it was actually in the non extinction prone state and transitioned twice to the extinction prone state. So there's an example, just as a thought um, experiment that you cannot infer ancestral states if those states influence the shape of the tree. So we've been using um, developing likelihood methods, and by we, I mean primarily um, Wayne Madison, my colleague at UBC, and 
um, my PhD student, Rich Fitzjohn. So we've been developing likelihood methods to infer parameters of interest along a phylogeny. And, you, and what are these parameters of interest? So I'm going to walk us through the model um, construction. Can I just before that? So, yeah. so the, a trait here it could be one gene or many genes responsible for it? Or are you going to... So a trait can be anything. It can be whether you're sexual or asexual. I'll give you an example of that later. It can be whether or not you are in the tropics or in the temperate zone. So it could be a geographic association. Or it could be an amino acid presence or absence at, at a site. So trait is very broadly defined. So the model I'm going to take us through is a multi-state branching process where we're going to ask what can happen over a period of time along a tree. So there are a whole bunch of different processes that could happen, and we have parameters for each of it. The, each of them, the, pop, the lineage could go extinct, and that extinction rate mu can depend on the state of the lineage. There can be transitions from one state to the other, from state 0 to 1, so from sexual to asexual, or vice versa. And there can also be speciation events. Those are, those are what cause the nodes to appear in our trees. Or the lineage can continue as is. And these are all forward time rates. So the goal is if we can come up with a likelihood of seeing our data, seeing the phylogeny as well as the tip states, then we can estimate parameters like are the extinction rates different for these two traits? Or are they the same? Are the speciation rates different? Or the same. So the question is, how do we develop that likelihood? Until you go down the tree, you develop differential equations, and ta-da. But I, I, uh, rather than doing the standard thing of saying, just take my word at it, I think it's actually quite instructive to see how we derive these likelihoods. And so I'm going to turn this off, because it's no help, and go to the board. So I just want to give you a flavor for how these calculations are performed. The basic um, quantity that we want to calculate is what I'm going to call D. And D <laughs> is the probability, I'm going to draw something, you know, this is the tree as it exists above us. And here we are at some point in time T. And so there's a, you know, there's a phylogeny up here, and there's trait states up here. And all of that is considered the data. And this is the probability D, and um, is the probability, let's say that you're in state 0 at that point at time t in the past. What is the probability that everything that you see from that point on will have descended from this point? So you'll, you'll see this phylogeny as is. You'll see the traits among those extant species as is and nothing else. So what you see is what you get. So what we have to do to derive a dynamical equation for um, this process then is ask what would happen over a small interval of time as we go path, um, further back in time. How would that probability of seeing what we see change? So that's fairly straightforward. We're okay, now we're back a little, little bit in time. Can you see the red okay? And all we have to do is ask what are all the possible things that could have happened in that little bit of time and how would they change the probability? Well, let's do the easy one first. It could have gone extinct in that little interval of time. But then you've got a problem, because you can't explain the data that you see. So that will have, be associated with a probability of 0 of seeing the data that you see, assuming we're actually on a part of the tree that's on the tree. The other possibility is that there could have been a transition from state 0 to 1 in that small little period of time. And then we can still explain the data as um, um, evolving the way it has evolved, but we would be explaining it from the other state, from the D1 state rather than the D0 state. And then the last of the processes that could happen that uh, we're focusing on is, an ex is a speciation event in this little period of time. Now, what I'm talking about is moving down a lineage. And there's actually not a branch in that little period of time. That is, we're on a, uh, on a branch, not at a node, in this little time interval. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a speciation event there. There could have been. But if, that, if there was a speciation event there, that lineage would have had to have gone extinct by the present. 
Now that lineage might have even diversified further, speciated more. But then all of the subbranches would have had to go extinct. So I'm just going to introduce a new variable, call that E, for the probability that um, a lineage, a lot, so D is the probability of seeing the data that descends from a particular point in time, T. And E is the probability that a lineage existing at time T leaves no descendants. So if there was a speciation event there, that's fine, but we would have had to have the daughter lineage go extinct. But one, one correction to this, we don't know whether that daughter lineage is metaphorically on the right or the left. It's either one could have gone extinct. So there's two, two ways for that to happen. So there's a two in front of there. And th those are all of the possible events that can happen in the tree. And then, of course, you have the possibility that nothing happens in that little interval of time. And then you explain the data by D in state zero again. What was that? Shouldn't be a two lambda? Two lambda zero delta. That's fine, but then in the other part. No, 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 no. It's not the lambda zero is the probability that an a speciation event happens in this little interval of time. Lambda zero times um, delta t. It might be easier to think about it as putting the extinction rate, the two in front of the extinction rate, because either subbranch, other resulting branch can go extinct. All right. So this is all fine. This is then you can shrink the time interval, turn it into a differential equation, and numerically solve this down the tree. Of course, I introduced another variable along the way, which means we actually have to do the same thing for e of zero. But the method is now fairly clear. That in a, a particular lineage alive at time t will go extinct and not leave any descendants. Well, it, there's three things that could happen along a little time interval. There could be an extinction event. Well, that's great. If that happens, then the probability that the lineage goes extinct by the present is now 1, because it has just happened. Or there could be a transition to the other state, but then we have the same problem. The lineage still has to go extinct, but it has to do so by the present, now in state 1. And finally, there can be a, a speciation rate in that little period of time, but now we've got two problems. We've got two lineages that have to go extinct by the present. Assuming they're independent, that would then give us the square of their extinction rates. Okay, so another question. In that term that has the lambda zero delta t to e zero. Yeah. Um, you're not putting the d zero. Oh, thank you. That's right. Very good. Because you also have to explain the branch that survives. Okay, I think that's, let me just double check. We're done, those are the, those are the calculations needed to perform the, this descent down a tree to explain this data that we see. There's also the chance that, that nothing happens on the extinction case. Yep. Zero times t. And you also have tip states to consider as well. But those are fairly trivial um, starting conditions. For example, the probability of seeing an extinction event at time zero, given that, you s that the lineage is there, is zero. You can't, there's no time for it to go extinct. Similarly, if I'm taking a look at a particular branch along this tree, and it's in state one, then the probability for that branch that I can explain the data, given that it was in state zero, is zero, because it won't have time to turn into state one in, t in, that, in no time. But if I allow it to be in state one, then I can explain the data. And we'll come back to that in a second. So you go down the tree. At nodes, you account for the speciation rate itself happening in that little interval of time. And as I mentioned, that's proportional to lambda um, in the state that the system is in and the little um, interval of time. All right. 
So I think that gets us back to the slides. Any questions about roughly that method? So we've got differential, now we've got four differential equations. If you've got a trait that is binary trait in two states, zero and one, and as we go down the tree, we're calculating this probability of seeing what we see descended from that point. So once we're at the root of the tree, we sum over the root states to get an overall likelihood of observing the data. Um, and having done that, now that you have a likelihood, here's the chance of seeing this tree and the chance of seeing the descendant taxa with their states, we can then do likelihood ratio tests or um, MCMC analyses to infer things about the traits, effects, and speciation extinction. So I'm going to breeze through the first part, the next two slides, which um, look at a simulation test of the method. So these are simulations forward in time of 500 taxon trees using specific effects on the species of uh, specific parameters for all of the speciation, extinction, and transition rates. And these are, this is actually a summary of two sets of simulations, either where the speciation and extinction rates are the same, sorry, speciation rates are the same for the two traits, so the trait has no effect for these hollow parameter estimates. And then in the second set of parameters, one of the speciation rates was double the other set of parameters, so those are the solid points. And the point of this set of simulations was that the method does fairly well on average of getting the right parameter estimates out and can distinguish cases where the speciation rates are equal from cases where the speciation rates are unequal. So this was just looking for whether there were biases in the method that were particularly strong. Now I should say that speciation is typically better estimated than transition rates and in extinction rates across this tree. There's, so the red point is an average over all of the inferences and it's still accurate, but you can see a lot more noise, especially with the extinction rate estimates. So there's no, there is signal there, there's just less signal. And at an intuitive level, the whole tree mainly provides us with an estimate of how fast it's growing, the growth rate. And the growth rate is called the net diversification rate or the speciation minus the extinction rate. So most of the tree provides us information about that, how fast it's diversifying. Most of the signal about the extinction rate is coming from the tips. And whether or not you see more tips in the tree than you'd expect based on how the whole group has diversified. And you'd expect a tippy tree if this, um, those character states lead to a very high extinction rate because those new baby species that have just arisen haven't had time to go extinct yet. And Sean Nee labeled this the pole of the presence in his lineage over time plots where you'd see the signal of extinction is mainly coming from recent tips of the tree. And the question, and what this method is using to infer a difference in extinction rate is whether or not that pole of the present depends on the character state. That's at an intuitive level. So I'm not telling it that that's what it should use. Um, can I answer a yeah. question? I hope it's just about the simulations themselves, but sometimes you didn't get a tree. Yes. This is conditional, Sean, uh, following Sean Nee's um, assumption. We condition on there being two branches in your tree. Now you could say you must have, you would never do a, phyla, a comparative analysis on a tree with two species. So that conditioning it on a much more sophisticated, we'll only bother doing this analysis with X number of taxa and this amount of variation in the taxa is something that should be thought about further. Well, I was just wondering about if we can imagine, if we want to think beyond to the world of speciation analysis, yep. we only get reported certain trees. And yep. Is that where you're headed, probably? I'm going to he I'm going to head there in a little way, and 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 check. I suspect there's um, more hidden bugaboos than what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about one of them. Um, and that's going to come up really soon. So this method is great in that it allows you to, dis in, to disentangle speciation and extinction. Remember, the sister clade analysis does not allow you to distinguish the two. So this is the first method that will give you estimates for speciation rates and their differences and extinction rates and their differences. 
and you can run it in R, blah, blah, blah. But here's the first bugaboo that requires, so far, it requires full phylogenetic information. That's an impossibility. Most trees, you don't have, you don't have a full tree of a particular group. You have a subsample tree. So that's, that's the bugaboo that I want to talk about next. So this method would basically be unusable if we required that. Because remember, I, I did, we did simulations with 500 taxa. There's not a huge amount of signal in phylogenetic trees. If you want estimates of speciation and extinction rate, you have to have big trees. But you don't need complete trees. Um, and, the, and, and I'm going to show you just briefly the two methods that we've used for incomplete trees. The first method is actually a fairly simple one. If the species on your tree is a random sample of species, nobody ever samples randomly, but if they did, then that's actually easy to incorporate because it's really like there's an extra sampling step on top of the present. And so all we have to do is account for the fact that not only did that species have to survive to the present in that state, but we also had to sample it. So it just changes the starting conditions on this method. And you can do that in a fairly sophisticated way. You don't have to assume that they're the same sampling processes for sexuals and asexuals. You can have those be different rates. And you can also fine tune it if you know I've well sampled in this clade and poorly sampled in those, this clade. Then you can give them different sampling properties. The other method that you can that we've used, which is a more complicated one, is let's say sometimes people will say, I've got this one species that's representing my genus. So this is my genus, and I've got one species on my tree, and here's another genus, and I've got one species on my tree. So the phylogeny is kind of over-dispersed in its sampling with one member representing a clade. And, and so the phylogeny... Um, I'm saying there's unresolved information. You know the rest of the genus, you're assuming the rest of the genus falls in this part of the tree, but you don't know how it's resolved. So for that sort of data, if that's the data set you have, then you can use forward time multi-type branching models to say what's the probability of going from one lineage to seeing all of this diversity that you see at the present in that clade. It's limited numerically to you really can't go above clades of size 200, otherwise it goes crazy. But that at least allows you to use all of your information. You may know, for example, that there are 50 asexual species and two, uh, the other way, 50 sexual species and two asexual species in this clade. And you can use that information by asking, what's the chance of going from one to 52 species, two of which have the right state? Okay. So the, the next question is, well, when you, when you don't have all the information, how much do you lose? Do we really need fairly complete trees before we have a good power to estimate processes across the phylogenies? And this was, this was one of those moments looking at these graphs. I was like, wow, that's great news. So what, am, what have I got here? Let's focus on this side. This is um, 500 species trees, 250 species trees. Symmetric, that's not very meaningful. That means that the speciation rates were actually the same. Asymmetric means that there was a difference in the speciation rate. But the x-axis is what's really interesting. So, well, let's start with the y-axis. This is the confidence interval for a particular um, difference in the diversification rate. So on this left-hand side, there's no difference in diversification rate. And the width of this bar tells us how confident we are in our inference across the simulation. And this is where we've dropped, this x-axis say, how many of those 500 species do we drop from our analysis before running the inference? And then this is where it's quite interesting. We actually don't lose much confidence until we're down to almost 50 species. And the reason for that, I think, is that by and large, there's so much stochasticity in any one realization of the tree of life, and that's already accounted for in this likelihood process, that you don't actually need, a, you need kind of just a skeleton representation of that tree to get most of the data out. Now, I should say that those confidence intervals widen faster for extinction rates, which is, again, consistent with a view 
that extinction is largely coming, information is largely coming from the tips of the tree of life. And the other thing I want to point out is there's two sets of lines here. This is the confidence interval for that method where the missing taxa, we knew where they were, and we use that terminal clade method and put them in the right spots in the tree. And that remains more powerful for longer. The sampling method where we say, we don't know where those missing taxa are, but they come from somewhere in the tree is a little less powerful. But I think the bottom line message is quite interesting. You don't need the full tree to get inferences out on speciation and extinction. But this depends to some extent on how large the extinction rates are in comparison to the length of terminal branches, right? And how long the terminal branches are depends on what proportion of tips are seen. Oh, I'm, yes, I'm... You have a very dense tree, all terminal branches are short. And... Yeah. So if you, if you only have a few samples and get long terminal branches, then you can't... <clears throat> then you lose it's, your information it's sooner. That's right. Branches. That's right. And so this, you know, so we can we can see a little bit like that here we, by just comparing these two graphs. This only has 250 species, and so we lose that information faster because we end up with those long terminal branches sooner than um, we do down here when we have quite a bushy 500 species tree. But uh, the other point that you raise is whenever you do a simulation study of a particular method, it depends on what parameters you've happened to choose. So we're going to ignore that and go on. But no, that's a really good question. One of the things that we don't know is how much we can break the assumptions of the method and still get decent inferences out. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, too. So the other, the, what it, we, we've done recently is look at other types of traits. So you can look at quantitative traits for example, body size or sexual dimorphism. And now what you're inferring is not these discrete probabilities of um, seeing the descendant taxa in a particular state, but now you have a function of, of um, any particular body size, for example. And the speciation rate and the extinction rates are also functions, non-negative functions. For example, you might be interested in, having a sp in seeing whether the speciation rate increases with body size. That might be your, the question that you're interested in, and you may be testing that against a null hypothesis where the speciation rate does not depend on body size. The other, the other questions that you may want to look at are, OK, you started by looking at whether or not the um, organism was asexual or sexual, for example. But what, uh, what if you also know that perenniality or some other trait is correlated with that first trait? And you want to know, well, which is it that's the um, better predictor or better, is better associated with speciation and extinction rate differences? And to be able to answer that question, you have to be able to fit these trees to more than one character. So that's one of the things we've done. Or to multiple states of a single character. The other thing that is a fairly easy extension to do is here, when I did the speciation rate, I assumed that the daughter was also in the same state, zero. But it could be that the trait that you're interested in is actually the driver of the speciation event. That is, the character change, uh, the character changed because the speciation event happened. Polyploidization, for example, could drive speciation. Or if you have a niche, uh, um, evolution into a new niche, it could be that character transition allowed the speciation event. But that's fairly easy to incorporate because you then kind of unpack this event and say, well, yes, but at that speciation event, there's a probability of changing states as well. And then you follow the same equations, but allowing for that possibility. So it allows you to get at how much of the change do we see across the tree is happening at the nodes of the tree and how much is happening along the branches. And importantly, when I say nodes of the tree, this doesn't just mean the nodes that we see. It means the speciation events also that happen along the branches that we don't see because some of their daughters went extinct. So this, for example, if all of those um, species went extinct, we also want to be able to say, oh yeah, that event actually was associated, that speciation event was actually associated with a transition between 0 and 1, even if we don't see that node today. <laughs>
Okay, so that's another um, extension. And I'm just going to do a quick run through a, an empirical example and then talk at the, about related issues um, within a population. So this is a project that it, we did with Mark Johnson of University of Toronto, uh, Mississauga. And he had developed this phylogeny of the group of evening primroses known as Enothera. Enothera was a classic flower studied by De Vries because of this incredible ring chromosome structure due to a series of translocations between their chromosomes. Their whole genome of some of these Enothera are tied up in a ring. So every single chromosome is kind of pairing up with the ends of another chromosome all the way through their entire genome. These ring structures then, during meiosis, rather than segregating each chromosome independently, the ring gets pulled apart with one ma the maternal ring being separated from the paternal ring. And crazily enough, in these enothera that are effectively asexual, it self puts together that maternal and paternal genome and recreates the parental genome crazy system. So it breaks apart its genome and puts it back together every generation. And that system, of, it's called permanent translocation heterozygosity because um, you never see mother-mother genomes coming together. Even it, Y depends on the species. In some species, you only get the paternal going into the pollen and the maternal going into the alveoles. In other species, you can get the other type of seeds produced, but the maternal-maternal genomes carry um, lethal are lethal because of the homozygosity throughout the genome. Anyway, take a look at this tree. So this is the distribution of this asexual-like state called PTH across the tree of life. So red is asexual, blue is sexual. And um, this tree, uh, Mark's tree, had 113 of the 260 known PTH taxa in the clade. All right, so... Oh, and I should say also, this is a sample of the trees. There's a lot of phylogenetic uncertainty. And the graphs I'm about to show are MCMC graphs over that, phylo that a set of phylogenies, as opposed to assuming one particular phylogeny. All right, so this is what that data, what the inference is from the method. What the truth is, we don't know. So <clears throat> the pink is the asexual type, the PTH type. And the method infers that the PTH type actually speciates, the asexual type speciates at a higher, significantly higher rate than the sexual types. We actually had a reviewer say that's not theoretically possible. But it's, it's actually what I would say is the null prediction in that asexual types don't have to worry about, or they don't have gene flow perturbing the buildup of locally adapted gene complexes throughout the gene. So it's much easier for an asexual type to become locally adapted and potentially to um, speciate. The other thing that was a surprise was I was expecting, OK, maybe they speciate more often, but they might also go extinct more often, the asexual lineages. We didn't actually see that. The extinction rates um, were overlapping. You can see the prior in this little dashed line in there. And um, this extinction rate differences, whatever they were, were not big enough to um, affect the difference in speciation rate so that the net diversification rate was still higher for the PTH lineage than the um, sexual lineages. What's interesting, though, is this last graph, which says that, OK, they didn't go extinct, but they went back to sex quite often. So the inf inference there, thanks is that rather than seeing this asexual state as a, as a dead end that is extinction prone, these lineages may be trying it out, trying out asexuality and then coming back to sex. And that's also consistent with theories about what, ace, what the problems of asexuality are. For example, Muller's ratchet or the inability to adapt due to Hill-Robertson effects or what have you may lead eventually f to a sexual, an asexual population that is quite prone to being invaded by a sexual reverdant. That a sexual sublineage, if it arises within this population, introducing more genetic variation can spread. And you can kind of see hints in the tree of where that signal is coming from. It's coming from these, first of all, you can see that the, 
oftentimes the red, the PTH, is associated with a small, the, the um, rapid um, speciation branches, parts of the subtree, consistent with a view that it's promoting speciation. But you also see these blue lineages embedded within the otherwise asexual clades. And those are the ones that Mark is looking into to seeing if there is evidence in these clades that they may have reverted back, that they have asexual ancestors that went back to sex. So stay tuned. Um, and, and that's a good example of where I don't know that this is the truth. I suspect it's unlikely to be the truth. But it provides an alternative hypothesis. Most people working in this group had not considered the possibility that there could be reversions. And the reversions are not that um, hard to imagine. These plants still produce um, pollen. They still produce flowers. And mating between relative, related species could put to back together maternal-maternal genomes. Or you could get a series of translocations that undo enough of that ring structure to allow recombination to um, re arise again. One other um, example, and then I want to turn to my last point. This other example um, is by Itai, uh, my former postdoc, Itai Meros and others. And here we were looking at a trait which is polyploidy. And we were asking, does polyploidy lead, is it an evolutionary dead end? Or does it lead to diversification? And for those of you who have been reading the literature on the um, two rounds of polyploidization and the lineages leading up to vertebrates, to us and other vertebrates, there's a lot of contention there. Some people say it's because of those polyploidization events that um, we're as successful or as diverse a group as we are. But others, including Stebbins, who first wrote about polyploid, he said polyploids have a problem in that every single, um, the new mutations when they arise, they're very, very well masked by the large number of <coughs> gene copies at, that, at each gene. So polyploids, in terms of rates of adaptation, should be quite sluggish. And in that sense, they may be more prone to extinction. We looked at this, so the previous analysis was on one clade. We looked at this at 63 different clades of plants, asking, was there a consistent signal on the effect of ploidy on diversification rates? And here is a histogram of those 63 different analyses, asking, what's the probability across your MCMC runs that the diploid was the one that was more diverse? And you can see it's very right skewed. The diploid was more often diverse, and the polyploid less diverse. And we see that's driven by two things. There's a, diploids tend to speciate more, and they tend to go extinct at a slightly lower rate. Now remember, this is at the genus level. And so at the genus level, this in, implies that polyploids may arise a lot, but they're not persisting for very long. And so by and large, the likely fate of a polyploid lineage that, that first arises is to go extinct, more likely than if it hadn't polyploidized. But I should say that this doesn't tell, actually answer the question about whether those two rounds of polyploidization leading to us made much of a difference. Because that's really asking about much deeper events and whether or not those much deeper events had an, the ones that do survive, the polyploids that do survive, um, allow the subsequent lineages to diversify because of that extra um, geno um, genetic degrees of freedom provided by polyploidization. So open question about deeper parts in the tree. So the, the last um, part that I wanted to talk about in the context of this conference was what this, so these are birth death models. And I've been talking about them as if, you, as if your data is about species. But what if you have data from within a species and you have a phylogeny from within a species? Can you use these methods? Um, and Stadler, and the, and the advantage of doing this is that you can kind of avoid the ancestral selection graph because the birth death model assumes independence of your different lineages and just asks whether a particular trait increases the branchiness, bushiness of the tree that you see. Um, as a proof of principle, Stadler and Bonhoeffer applied a, um, this method. They 
um, I had to modify it a little bit because they were using it with HIV data. And HIV data, not all of the sequences were sampled at the same time, but they had data sets where they were sampling at different points in time. And they had to account for that sampling process as well. But they were able to um, detect differences. Now, speciation wasn't speciation. It was transmission to a different individual, where it was in one individual before the branching that they're interested in is that one lineage in one individual became lineages in two individuals. And they were able to detect a difference in the diversification rate with um, a higher transmissibility from through intravenous drug user hosts than heterosexual hosts with their HIV-1 phylogeny. And the last graph that I'll show you asks the following question. Getting back to Richard's question about how much can we break the tree and still have it work? One of the breaks that I'm interested in is, what if it's wrong that it's a birth-death model? What if instead it's actually a fixed population size model, like a coalescent type model? And here we've done simulations using a Moran model, and that's got a fixed population size, and every time you sample one species or one type to give birth, you randomly sample another type to go extinct or to die. And so we, that's, that's the opposite type. This has strong density dependence. You always have the N individuals in your sample. And you simulate it, but you ask if there's a difference between your types in their fitness, in their birth rates, or in their speciation rates. Then what will this method infer about those differences in birth rates? And so here's a set of simulations. We're just starting this, and this is with Carl Rothfels at UBC. We're just starting this. But in this set of simulations, there was no difference in the birth rate. And the inferred difference in speciation rate or birth rate using the birth death model that I've been telling you about is centered on zero with a very small um, false um, positive rate of 3.4%. And over here, we have there actually was a difference in fitness. And one type was more fit than the other type. And there, with this tree, we were able to detect a difference in the birth rates of, um, so the true difference was 10% um, or 0.1, sorry, and it was well-centered. And we have a decent power with these trees of inferring the higher fitness of the one type over the other type. So I think this is suggestive as another way. So what does this need? You need a phylogeny of a particular region you need to be able to say, I'm interested in, say, an amino acid difference. And I want to infer what the effects of that amino acid are on the, the sh shape of the tree. You also need to be able to say something about how you sampled your sequences. Because this method is really critically dependent on properly describing your sampling design. It has to go into your likelihood analysis. Otherwise, something that you don't sample will be thought will be will mimic an extinction event. So you have to be very clear about your um, sampling design. But at any rate, it, it, I think it's interesting because it suggests another way we might be able to detect selection if we can get such um, phylogenies within species. And I think going back to the last talk, of course, you also have to account for recombination. But you could imagine applying these methods across your different inferred blocks with their different phylogenies within a, within a Group. All right. Thank you. Questions? So, what would happen if you started thinking about the range, the geographic range of species? So, one extreme would be, say, there's a very broad range and then it's split up into the same. And then there's clearly non independence. On the other hand, you can imagine sympatric speciation where you have more and more species in the same place. How do you do? No, that's a, that's a messy, messy trait. Uh, like, do you want to take the midpoint range or do you want to take the upper and lower limits of your trait? Um, yeah, and then I think it depends exactly on what your model of speciation rate is. So for the cladogenet, let's say that you believe that new species are formed at the edge of a um, range and that they bud. So then that's saying that's a cladogenesis model where your trait is small for one daughter species and larger for the other daughter species. And you could do that in a quantitative framework. But it's assumption. There's a lot of assumptions, I think, when you deal with range. Because you could, you could imagine a different way that this 
there's um, some Patrick speciation across the full range, and the daughter species has the same range size as the parent. So there's, I think there's some traits that, for which they're too messy. We don't know enough about their process of evolution, I think, to use them. I was wondering if we can deal with some gene flow between species and, uh, and the fact that maybe it might occur more often in this shallow part of the tree? Or? And that's a really good question, and I think an open one with respect to how it influences these. So that's another way we can break the model. So for the plant data, we tended to use chloroplast data for the trees to avoid this very sticky issue when you're dealing with polypoids, often which form through hybridization. Um, but no, I, I, a very good question. Is it sensitive to a really low rate of uh, migration events or hybridization events? Don't know. Don't know at all. Uh, Andy? So in the, in, the, in the theory example, isn't there a big difference in, in the definition of speciation and the sexuals and asexuals? I love Ina Thera. It's such a great example. It's, it's one of the best to have done this sort of analysis because they still produce pollen. And how they assess the species concept is even for the asexuals, they use the biological species concept. They take pollen from one plant and cross it to the ovules of another plant and actually see if it produces viable seed. That's fine, but still, in terms of the, the actual process of splitting, it's like they're just separate clonal lineages or yeah. called species in asexuals. No, that's right. In the asexuals, they're defined by the biological species concept. Whereas if you were looking, because they do the crossability study, but if you were looking at rotifers or something else where there's no, there's no biological species concept that you can use for the asexuals because you can't cross them, then you'd be really stuck. You'd, You'd have to use you have to use the same species metric across your tree, otherwise you're confounding um, your our, our human definition of species with the speciation rate differences. But with Enothera, that's an unusual one where you can still use the biological species concept. So it sounds like you're puzzled over well, that. It just seems like the, the the number of genetic events required to establish this incompatibility. For an asexual lineage, it could just be one allele, one, you know, one last translocation. Because they're always transmitting as a clonal yep. thing, but it's much simpler and faster than for a sexual. To speciate. Yeah. yeah, which is why I think we, that, allow, that is consistent with the inference of a higher speciation rate for the um, asexuals. Putting it another way, the asexuals were faster at developing um, biological. Um, reproductive isolation than the sexual clades. Probably, possibly because they're not mixing up those genes. So with respect to Andy's question or this issue, and going back to your polypoids, it seems to me like a, an interesting observation, which I think exists for the polypoids at least, is that some polypoids, as you, you know better than I, uh, arise as a single, maybe individual. Yeah. And other ones that arise as a, some kind of hybrid swarm where there's quite a bit Recurrent. of genetic diversity. Yep. And the same thing, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know the situation in Nina Thera about whether there's any indication that these asexuals mm -hmm. arise through some kind yep. of population phenomena as opposed to an individual. But that seems to me like it's very relevant to extinction. Absolutely. Um, I can tell you that one thing we're trying to investigate is. Polyploids are typically classified into two main classes, autopolyploids and allopolyploids, and the data that we had could not distinguish them, but we're trying to build up a data set where we can say, does it matter? Are allopolyploids much more likely to persist than autopolyploids? In the case, do we know about the origins of these things ever arise? Uh, where's Mark? I don't know. I, I don't know that multiple origins, I know multiple origins is known to com it, to be fairly common in polyploid plants. I don't know about either. There's a question over there. Any more questions? Yeah. In the Moran models, yeah. um, what other parameters did you have in there besides the population, besides the n equal 100? Right. So, um, so the main parameters of the model were the, um, birth rate in state zero and the birth rate in state one. And then the way we simulated it, so those could be different. But then when one thing went was born, another type went extinct at random. And you can flip it around and do the Moran model the other way. 
So I think those are the only two. Yeah. They were the the birth rates were the same, and on the one on the left, the birth rate was higher for one type. Um, so the simulations were, we did the simulation, did a tree, applied BISI, the method for inference, and said, can BISI, which does not assume a Moran model but assumes a birth-death model, can it infer a difference in the, in, the, in the birth rates? So that's what those simulations were reporting. And, and I think that that's an example where the method for, um, is not that sensitive to, to Simulating your phylogenies, um, assuming a constant n versus assuming a birth-death model that doesn't have a constant n. But for other way, other breaks to the assumption, we still don't have a really good sense of what you can break and what you can't break. Other questions? No. Let's thank the speakers again.